Fighting in Georgia's breakaway Republic of South Ossetia grabbed the headlines this summer. But in the neighboring region of Abkhazia, a tragedy was secretly unfolding. Vicious ethnic hatreds have driven this bloody war. Now its villages stand empty and their inhabitants have fled. We arrived in Abkhazia, sandwiched between Russia and its enemy, Georgia. Reports had trickled in of a battle in the Kuduri Gorge, high in the Caucasus Mountains. The Abkhazians warned us not to go there. The government's not too happy about us going. We've been told that we may be turned back. We're still going to try to get there anyway. We passed a column of Russian troops. Moscow had reinforced the Abkhazians in their fight against pro-Western Georgia. We've been stopped by the police for some reason. Here you go. They ordered us not to film. We talked our way through one checkpoint. But again, the way ahead was blocked. There's some troops here, and uh, an armoured personnel carrier blocks the way. Why are we not allowed in? Is there still fighting? The militia commander said nobody was allowed into the gorge. They just won't reveal why it is that we can't get up there. They've clearly got something to hide. We heard that fighting in the isolated Kadori Gorge had been fierce. We wanted to know what had happened to civilians. Next day, the Abkhazians invited a group of mainly Russian journalists on a tour of the valley. We hitched a ride on the helicopter. From the air, we saw villages that looked abandoned. For years, the Georgian military have had bases in this disputed territory. These now lay in ruins. The Abkhaz told us they had bombarded this stronghold. In a destroyed ammunition dump, unexploded ordnance littered the ground. The Deputy Defence Minister has charged off in that direction with the press pack following him to display, I think, a military camp. But what we're really interested in is civilians. We slipped away, entered the village of Ajara and found it eerily deserted. Should we go up here? The front door was open. Hello? Inside was a hastily abandoned meal. The uh, inhabitants are nowhere to be found. Just um, all the signs of the family having left very, very quickly. Hello? The next house was exactly the same. Right, the place has been ransacked. Some things been smashed and every single drawer has been opened and the place has been turned upside down. I don't know whether these people are dead or if they've run away. I just want to know their story because empty houses like this don't tell me the full story. And I don't think that the Abkhazian military are telling us the full story either. Right, OK, we've just been waved at by some soldiers and some guys with guns are coming over saying that we can't go up to one of those civilian houses. They stopped us from checking the houses and ordered us to leave. 
Walking through these villages, I can see now that all of the civilians have abandoned them. Maybe a couple have trickled back, but really the only people left here now are Abkhazian soldiers. This was the latest flare-up in separatist Abkhazia's 16-year war with Georgia. It remains a pariah state, completely dependent on Russia's military muscle. We headed south from the gorge. These are Abkhazian forces pulling back from the border at Gal, which they think they've secured with Russian help. They feel that they've secured their borders. Relentless conflict has led to a collapse of the economy and has turned Abkhazia into a land of ghost towns. In a bitter ethnic war that has cost thousands of lives already, the killing continues on both sides. We were invited to the funeral of a young Abkhazian soldier. <laughs> Ralph Hutaba was just 19 years old. He was the victim of a roadside bomb. The entire village was distraught with grief. She said the boy was so badly mutilated, his coffin had to remain closed. They used to break bread with the Georgians, she said, but then they started attacking us. She says, there is only one Abkhazian homeland. They have nowhere else to go. Why don't they leave us in peace? For centuries, Georgians and Abkhazians lived together, but most Georgians have been forced to flee their homes in the fighting since the 1990s. I found the dead man's brother. He can't live alongside the Georgians in the same country. That would be unacceptable for him. As they buried the boy, mourners vowed revenge. We arrived in the capital, Sukhumi, to find crowds gathering in the bomb-damaged city centre. People are gathering for a nationalist rally in a square outside what used to be the government headquarters. It was destroyed during the fighting in the 1990s, and you can still see that it's a burned-out shell like a lot else in this country. Crowds waved Russian flags alongside their own. Without Moscow's money and guns, Abkhazia could not survive. Abkhazian leaders called for international recognition of their independence. In the 1990s, Abkhazia ethnically cleansed 250,000 Georgians. I went to see the Republic's president, Sergei Bagapsh. How do you do, Mr. President? I wanted to ask if he had now done the same thing in the Kadori Gorge. Do you hate the Georgians? He said he hated those who built their happiness on the blood of others, but he denied hating Georgians. Even his wife was one, he said, but he blamed the Georgian leadership for the current conflict. You captured the Kador Gorge recently. The civilians all fled. Is this ethnic cleansing? He claimed the Abkhaz forces had given people in the gorge three days' warning before fighting started. He said he now wanted them to return to their homes. 
Can we go, please, back to the gorge, with your permission, to check on the fact that they're returning? The president says that people are trickling back, and he's given us permission to go back to the Kador Gorge to see them come back. We set off up the gorge to test the president's claims. On the way, we drove through derelict towns depopulated years ago and now reverting to forest. We're in the centre of a village called Chalter, and you can see the place is being devastated by the fighting. I don't know what happened here. Clearly, there was some kind of fire, and um, the police station has taken a bit of a hit. And then there was uh, some form of military camp here, and this seems to have been walloped by a mortar bomb. It's very unclear what has really happened to the civilians. The village was being held by a motley crew of Abkhazian militias. Where are all the civilians? The commander said that during the fighting, all the civilians had fled into the forest. They're trying to coax them back home with offers of food, like bread, and they're hoping that they'll return. The people who lived here were from an ethnic Georgian minority called the Svans. Their villages had been heavily defended by the Georgian forces who had occupied this area. Was this a Georgian position? Yes, it was a position. He said they were Svans or Georgians who had manned the gun. He made no distinction. And, and where are they now? Where are they now? I don't know where. He said the Svans had gone. It seems some Abkhazian soldiers regarded the Svans as enemy combatants rather than innocent civilians. We came to a house and went to take a closer look. Looks pretty abandoned to me. It's pretty eerie. There are ammo boxes everywhere, untended uh, beehives, ducks and chickens and pigs around, but no people. Where are the people? Someone's been burning something. <coughs> Something's been going on here. There's a bad smell coming from in here. The smell is just ghastly. I, I could smell something dead. Hello? <coughs> oh, God. Someone's shot the dog. There's blood everywhere on this duvet. I think this place has been left in a hurry, but this is obviously the family ancestors. And, and maybe some more recent pictures of of uh, perhaps the man of the house, but he's with some Russians here. <laughs> this is not what you do to a group of people that you want to stay. Um, the government was saying that people had fled and that they were trying to persuade them to come back, but clearly it's not intended that these people should come back. Every house we visited was completely ransacked. Hello? Anybody home? Hello? What we saw contradicted the president's claims that civilians were trickling back. We needed to find Sfan people to hear their side of the story. We just found a civilian. Come on, come on. 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 Come on.
منم دیر دارم تمام ماشین دودو گولدانی said villagers had heard explosions and gunfire. Did you have any warning that there would be fighting before it started? Ara, say them. She said nobody had received any warning, which also contradicted what the president had told me. Why didn't you run away? She said her husband refused to leave, but that she did not know what had become of her daughter and five grandchildren. The woman's husband appeared. I went to speak to him, as our every move was watched over by an armed and angry soldier. How many people are there in this village at the moment? He knew of only ten people. How many are there normally? He said about three thousand. It's very difficult to talk to them because the Abkhazian military is standing about, and whenever they start talking, these guys keep intervening. So it's very difficult to get a clear picture. The Abkhazian soldier grew impatient and cut the interview short. What? Well, what's the problem? You think that we, you know, we have to go. We heard the villagers had fled into Georgia. We headed to the Russian checkpoint that marks the de facto border between Abkhazia and its neighbour. But they refused to let us through. We've just been told to leave by the Russian forces, and although this is an Abkhazian border point with an Abkhazian flag, it's clear that the Russians are in charge. To reach Georgia, we had to drive to Russia, take a ship to Turkey, and go in overland. Instead of half an hour, the trip took three days. In the town of Kutaisi, we heard that refugees had arrived from the Kaduri Gorge. We found them living in squalid conditions. There are collection points, they call them, where refugees are gathering, and they're given housing in places like derelict schools. We've just arrived at one building where we hear there are people from the villages that we ourselves visited. Georgian aid workers at this centre handed out food to the refugees. I wanted to know about villagers from the part of the gorge we'd seen. Do you have people from the villages of Chalta, Ajara, and and Kwachara? The aid workers told us there were 39 families in town. They directed us to a set of derelict buildings where they had been housed. This woman cried as she asked if I had news of her missing husband. She feared he was dead. This woman is still looking for her husband from the village of Chalta. She says that they were separated during the attack and she's not even sure whether he's alive. We'd been told where relatives of the elderly couple we had met might be found. Do you recognize that man? She said it was her grandfather. He's okay though, he's all right. And I'm going to show you your, your grandmother as well. <laughs> Grandma? Now that you see them and they're okay, does that make you want to go back as well to your village? She said she was too afraid to return and no Georgians should go back. Do you think that they should leave now or do you think that they should stay at home? 
she said they must leave. I wanted to find the family whose dog had been shot. I had a photo of the man with me from his ransacked house and discovered his name was Seridiani. We got a call to say he was staying at a nearby refugee center with relatives. We've tracked down, we think, one of the people um, from one of the abandoned houses, the one with the dead dog. And um, he's now living with his son, we hear. Oh, that's him. That is him. That's him. Hi. How are you? I think that we went to your house. I'm sorry that we that we took it out, but we wanted to find a photo of you to identify you. Serodiani said the Russians had arrived in Kaduri pretending to be peacekeepers, but they turned out to be their enemies and had attacked. His wife appeared and broke down in tears when she heard we had visited their home. The Kaduri Gorge had been a peaceful haven for these people. Now they own nothing. One or two beds in each room, um, a few chairs, a very, very sparse way of life. This is what the people of the Kaduri Gorge have been reduced to. Georgia has little money and no jobs to offer the refugees of Kaduri. They face poverty here while their rich farms turn to ruin back home. She said they hardly managed to escape. They left at night. When the Russian forces saw the lights of their car, they started shooting at them. Do you think that you could return now? She said she would never be able to return to her village. She might die before ever seeing her home again. <laughs> Poor woman. In this latest round of fighting, Russian forces had not only conquered Kaduri, but also occupied a swathe of territory in western Georgia. On the road, we spotted a crowd of protesters marching against a Russian checkpoint and demanding them to leave. These are Russian military forces on Georgian soil. And over here are hundreds of Georgian civilians telling them to go home. These Russians pulled back to Abkhazia after these pictures were taken. The empty Kaduri Gorge is now the front line in the new Cold War. With tensions like these, the Sfan refugees have little chance of ever being able to go home.